Hi, this is Paul Cockshot. Because of the time lag issues, um, I'm not in a good position to be able to give the talk live, so I've decided to record it since it's supposed to be very short anyway. So I'm looking at the obstacles that there are to the Latin American countries having the success that China has had in terms of rapid economic development and social development. Now, in doing that, I'm going to be looking at the standpoint of classical political economy. If we go to Adam Smith, he says that the key difference between feudalism and capitalism was the dominance of an unproductive landlord class which impeded capital accumulation. He says, during the prevalency of feudal government, a very small portion of the produce was sufficient to replace the capital employed in cultivation. It consisted commonly in a few wretched cattle maintained altogether by the spontaneous produce of the uncultivated land and which might therefore be considered as part of that spontaneous produce. It generally, too, belonged to the landlord, and was by him advanced to the occupiers of the land. All the rest of the produce belonged to him, too, either as rent for his land or as profit upon his paltry capital. The occupiers of the land were generally bondsmen, whose persons and effects were equally his property. So, he's describing the old order which was par had passed by the time he was writing. But he still saw the landlord class as an unproductive drain on society. The same position was taken by the next great classical economist, Ricardo, who held that there was a tendency for the income share of the landlord classes to rise, and that this led to a declining rate of profit and a declining rate of economic progress. In fact, this tendency of the share of rent to rise is very clearly seen in recent British and American economic statistics. You then go on to the next great classical political economist, Marx. And if you look at the first demands in the Communist Manifesto, they're on the same theme, that of removing the unproductive drain of the landlord class. The very first demand was abolition of property and land and application of all rents to public purposes. The second, a heavy progressive and graduated income tax. And the third, the abolition of all rights of inheritance. Now, if we come to the 20th century, we see that the Chinese government, he headed by Mao Zedong, followed these same principles. The landlord class was expropriated. The rent revenue became available either to the local communes to fund local accumulation or by taxes to the central government to fund national accumulation. The removal of this drain has allowed China to sustain an absolutely huge rate of accumulation, reaching at times 45% of gross national product. It's this enormous rate of accumulation that allows for the rapid growth rate in China. And this enormous rate of accumulation would have been impossible were it not for the expropriation of the old feudal or semi-feudal ruling class. Now the effect of this camp rapid rate of capital accumulation allows improved productivity and also creates a big demand for labour, um, causing a rapid rise in real wages. In fact, this first graph here shows the index of labour costs in China rising rapidly. Federal Republic of Germany, USA, declining trend, i.e. labour becomes cheaper in those countries. In in terms of real wages, we can see the Chinese trend here. Other Latin, other American, sorry, other Asian countries 
have very poor performance in comparison apart from Thailand and Vietnam also has good performance whereas in the metropolitan countries wages have tended to fall. What other demands did Marx raise? Well, centralisation of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and exclusive monopoly. Centralisation of the means of transport and communication in the hands of the state. Extension of factories and instruments of production owned by the state. The bringing into cultivation of wastelands. Improvement of the soil generally in accordance with a common plan. Now, the Chinese government has been guided by these principles and th these other measures were more or less followed. The state controls most of the banks, the railways and owns a large share of the factories. Wastelands have been actively brought into cultivation or into forestry. For Latin America to follow the Chinese path means you have to start following it not now, but start following the path China took from 1949. The land in Latin America must be nationalized. The landlords must be liquidated as a class. The financial system nationalized. The main means of communication nationalized. And there must be a rapid extension of publicly owned factories. But that can only be done when the old state, the old machinery, which defends the rights of the landowners and landed property, is smashed and new people's republics are established under the leadership of peasants and workers, as China did in 1949.